and welcome to Deswell's Mumble Jumbo for this uh, April-ish, the 15th, maybe around that time. Uh, hello, I'm feeling better. Um, the nose is less blocked now. It is nearly a week later. Um, I am fucked off with it. I'm done. No more illness. Okay, no more of this. We've said this already, but no, I'm done with it. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're tunneling away for the year, aren't we? Lots going on. Uh, hopefully I can get back to more regular video schedule. Hopefully I can get some of the other videos filmed that I was going to get with the other guys. Who knows? I'm here now. Here I am. Let's do some video. Uh, so what have I played? Played, played is very short actually because I've played very fucking much. Uh, I brought you mostly up to date when we did the last video. Um, however, I did get in another game of Star Trek Ascendancy, a free play game of it on the weekend just gone. A weekend last, that same thing really, words different things. It's early in the morning. Um, Star Trek Ascendancy, yes. So, uh, play free player again as I covered in the last video from last week. If you've watched that, then I told you what it was all about. It's a 4X space game um, with a Star Trek theme. Um, we had significant issues in the first play of it, mainly that Robbie uh, got all of his rules wrong and made pretty much invalidated half of the game we played. So we came at it from a different angle this week. We thought we'd all learn the rules and know what we're doing, which was very nice. We switched the factions up. I had the Klingons, Jamie had the Federation, and Robbie had the Romulans. Uh, I did enjoy playing this a second time because it, I'm still trying to feel out the deeper strategies and tactics of the game. I think, I still feel it is a game that works actually quite well as a free player. If anyone's looking a group, looking for uh, a small group, looking for that 4X vibe, but in a free player account level, then I think this does not a bad job with the caveats of the player turn order, which we covered in the other video, which is everyone takes all of their actions, all their turns uh, in turn. Uh, but there's a strategy to that. And in a free player game, that kind of sweeps around fairly quickly. So yeah, we played the free player game of it. I was Cleons, uh, Jamie, the Federation. He won again. Um, he was doing astoundingly well. Helped, I must say, by uh, Robbie's Romulans, which the, they were the most shittest Romulans I've ever known in the world, the most cooperative Romulans. He was basically allowing Jamie to fly into his systems um, and gather research from anomaly in those outlying regions, which basically meant that Jamie could just be just channeling shit tons of research which allows you to upgrade all your weapons uh, your shields and all the tech and that's exactly what he was doing it was the federation the federation is all about research and seeing the galaxy so um he was pretty much being handed on the plate victory game conditions which exactly what happened i came close i was the klingons i did do a lot of attacking i attacked the throbby um uh, and uh, and and jamie but it was kind of a last gasp effort that couldn't quite do it he, he got the ascendancy but yeah i, I still uh, on it um i like it i like some of the strategies it's got there i like a lot of some of the things it does i love the exploration side of things it's, i think that's really good um but yeah it I, i'm still kind of great against the play order how the play system works and yet i understand how it works and i understand how it works in that game i just think it gives you a lot of downtime is the only thing but i think if you're willing to Maybe the small player counts and you're going to be watching what the other players are doing, which clearly you should be doing because lots of shit's going on on the board. Uh, and thematically, you've got a story to tell to a certain extent there. And if you can get into all of that, then I think there's a lot to enjoy in this. As, as I say, jury's out for me personally. I don't think I will be investing heavily into any more of Star Trek Ascendancy purely based on the points I've made. That I, I may be another faction potentially i would like to see what the other factions do see how much they shake it up um but yeah i i i, I balance that with hmm that's expensive isn't it um similarly um uh, before we get into the new section is the ascendancy no not ascendancy ascendancy we're done with now um eclipse eclipse second uh edition second dawn of the galaxy they have to put pre-orders up for the two faction boxes that they've got two um, sibs in each of these uh, new alien factions and miniatures and other stuff and all that in there um, which seems very expensive I think it's going to cost you over 120 130 quid to get both of them uh, for four extra factions which seems excessive I appreciate thinking about it that yes due to the second edition version of the game I presume you're getting the dashboards the plastic dashboards all the miniatures. you're getting everything for those factions in those boxes which is a lot of stuff 
Um, but it almost also feels like there could have been a cheaper alternative because basically taking aside all the plastic and all the bling and all the stuff and so a couple of the tokens, essentially that player board is the thing that controls the difference between the two factions. Um, so you could proxy everything else with just a different player board. We'll still give you those rules. Um, unless I'm missing something, which, I mean, if you wanted to play, okay, you can proxy it if you're going to play using the base game things to play it up to those six players. Um, if you want to play the higher player counts, then yes, you would need these to play the seven to eight to nine to ten players. Um, fine, that you would. I personally don't see the value in it, uh, if I'm honest. If it had all been together in one box for maybe about 50 quid, maybe 60 quid, I might have been in, might might I say, maybe be intrigued, maybe. But there doesn't seem to be that massive amount of difference you can have in those factions. It's not like, they're all kind of asynchronous and they're gonna be tweaks on that player board, but they are literally going to be tweaks on that player board. Uh, and it just feels a lot of money. Are you granted components that you'd need for those extra players? If they'd offered maybe an alternative uh, for those of us who don't want to have lots of extra players, we don't play 10 player games and just want to see those factions and play them out, then maybe an alternative cheaper option would have been nice. Or we'll just wait and then we can probably find it on the internet and you can proxy it. Uh, but there you go. I don't know. Your mileage may vary on that one. Uh, speaking of which, actually we got into it, should we do some news? Let's do that. News. <laughs> Oh, there's quite a bit of news, but most of it's nonsense. But I'll, I'll flip through this quite quickly, if I can. There's been uh, a lot of rattly news on Mattel putting out a new collaborative version of Scrabble. Uh, the BBC have been all over the shit. Um, uh, so it's got a game of Scrabble. Um, I, 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 that's, that's about as far as I can go on that, really. <laughs> I, mm, I mean... Kudos to the Mattel marketing team because not only have they got the BBC talking about it, they got me talking about it. So that's that's good work on their part. Um, I, I played Scrabble. I don't see how a collaborative version of that will make their game any better or intrigue me into playing it. I, I don't understand. So you'll just making words together on the board. Whatever works, I don't give a shit. Um, anyway, that. Uh, Monopoly is getting a movie from Margot Robbie's production company. I presume she'll be in it. I have no idea how they're going to make a fucking Marvel movie. I, a Marvel? A, mo a Monopoly movie. Um, did I say Marvel originally? I don't fucking know. It's early in the morning. Anyway, Monopoly movie. Utterly pointless. I don't know. I mean, if they get Greta Gerwig in, maybe they can do something. They did some fascinating stuff with the Barbie film, but I don't see... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's a storied backstory to Monopoly of the original creator. Um, I think it was a... a, a a woman designer had designed it originally um, and the whole basis of it was about to do with the social economics of the time and all that wonderful fascinating boring um and uh and having spent one evening in essen many years ago in front of someone from hasbro very senior bestowing or arguing or quite angry about um the fact that no one gets the rules right for monopoly and it's house ruled to death and it ruins the game ah, he wasn't very happy about it i've seen subsequently those posts turn up since i was very drunk at the time um and in fact actually did a dale trotter uh literally poleaxed um fell flat on my face in the middle of this meeting which was quite funny uh well for me i was very drunk um anyway moving on uh there's a lot of kickstarter stuff and crowdfunding stuff going on and i don't really know i'm going to talk about it because there's stuff on there i guess um but i'm not really doing much of it at the moment but well here we are um tiny epic game of thrones i was adjacently interested in this i mean having sat and just gone through a game of thrones marathon with the boys I'm still very much Game of thrones up. Um, I have the Game of Thrones game. I sold it, and I saw it cheap on Board Game Trading in the chat a little while ago and picked it back up. Still haven't played it again. It's not a game I got to there very often. It's kind of one of those that needs really the six players to really make it shine. At some point, I will play it again um, because it's got some DNA shared with Twilight Imperium in, in how it works. It was designed by Christian Peterson, the designer of Twilight Imperium, or at least the early editions of it in 
Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. Uh, I have a love... I mean, the only Tiny Epic game that I thought was any good was Galaxies, I want to say. I've played a few of the other ones, and they kind of bounced off me. I never really... Mm, uh, the West Wild West one I found was fucking awful. I love the idea of it, but it was fucking awful. Um, and I can't remember. I've played Ben's had a few others of them, but basically the Galaxies one I thought was okay. Um, it was pretty solid little game, dice rolling sort of game. Brilliant. So if you haven't got any of them, I'd recommend that one if you if you must. Um, this, I don't know yet. There's minis in it. Um, it's relatively reasonably priced. It has a co-op mode you can add if you, I think you pay a little bit more at the Kickstarter and um, stuff. I, I don't know. I don't know yet. I like the Game of Thrones theme. It doesn't look terrible. Um, I don't know if I can be bothered <laughs> or just wait to it to come out retail because I don't. There's, I have no FOMO on the stuff that's on there because there's nothing in there. I, mean, I must have um, unless you want a Tyrion Lannister miniature, if that's your thing. <coughs> Thank you. More tea, Vicar. Um, anyway, there's that. Then there's the Etinaut come from uh, Bow oh, Bucker Duck. Um, I'm trying to look for the box of the game of the guys that did it, and now I can't even see the box for the game. Pen Dragon! I didn't even find the box. I worked it out on my own. Um, Pen, Dra Pen Dragon Game Studios are uh, doing this and all. It's based on the quote book that I've never read, but essentially there is some snow that comes down and kills everyone. And there's some survivors um, hiding out somewhere in like an old warehouse, and they try and make it across the post-apocalyptic that um, wasteland uh, it looks kind of fascinating in that it's very sandbox the whole box is there's some base components in the game which is all kind of these blank almost board and components you have and a big deck of cards and a, and a storybook and essentially as you go for the adventure and you interact with people and items these cards for the people and items and other stuff have um, entries on them, number entries on them, which you combine into a, a bigger number, which you then look up in the book and it gives you what that interaction between those things were. Um, it also has semi-legacy elements. It's not a legacy game, nothing's destroyed, but it has these elements where you get certain points of the game at certain areas, the end of a scenario or something, you open a box that's in there, the base game, that will add some more components to the game and do some other stuff. I don't know any more than that. It's a story-driven game. Very much sandbox story-driven RPG game. It's it's all stuff that looks really cool and interesting. And Pendragon, I'm kind of on fence with because actually they did the thing board game, which I mostly was good. The rule book was a bit of a shambles, but the actual idea behind it was really solid and I think it really did capture the theme of that game. They did recently the Escape from New York game, which I didn't back. Um, and I'm so far withholding my FOMO in line because there was a lot of add-ons in that in that campaign which felt superfluous and pushed the price right up. But I may well pick it up at retail, is what I suspect. Especially as the thing went to retail eventually and then was really cheap a little while ago. So sit tight. Um, so this one is one that uh, looks interesting, looks fascinating. It's done well on Kickstarter at the moment. I like the idea of it. I think Charlie, who's to do our RPG segments, will probably chew this up and yummy, yummy, yummy. Um... I don't know. I don't know if I need any more thematic story-driven things like this in my world at the moment, as I've got a few of them. But count me, colour me interested. Uh, and then I meant to mention the other couple of weeks, but there's been a lot going on. I was ill. Um, there was the unfavorable expansion of the word and the name I can't pronounce very well, but that came out. Um, I, there was some new characters and some new beasties in it. Uh, it took a long time to come out um, to be announced, but that's coming, I think, later this year, quarter four maybe. Yeah. Mm. Uh, then there's Kickstarter drop in the end of April called Glim, which is coming from the, the uh, creators of the Blair Witch Project. Uh, and they're essentially trying to pitch a found footage board game or a found board game. Um, it's essentially the idea is it's, it's drafting... Um, dice based game which allegedly they're they're proposing was originally played by fairies there's a mock-up of like this sort of ancient artist act they found and there's like a republish a, a, the re it's a, a republish of this lost board game from the thing i kind of like a little bit of that vibe the the, the thing they did with the blair witch which was creating this other story and at the time when blair witch came out in the early 90s it was a almost the the it hit the perfect peak between the the internet rise of the internet and websites and people were properly catfished into thinking that that actually happened that the Blair Witch was real there was enough 
this information out there with the internet thing they did and a lot of the other stuff they put out there to actually some people were like were properly caught up in it this i can't see happening and doing that in any way possible but i, I you know i like the idea of a found footage board game in that capacity um so we should see how that plays out and that's out uh end of april on kickstarter that's about as far as my interest will probably go regarding that but i just thought i would put it on your radar um and then millennium blades is on kickstarter at the moment uh, i'm not saying you have to back a kickstarter game by any regards but millennium blades blah, blah, blah. it's early in the morning and i can't say words i'm gonna have some coffee fuck it Millennium Blades, uh, it's a great fucking wonderful game. It's insane. It's gonzo mad crazy. It is, it takes the idea of basically to simulate the entirety of the CCG life cycle of games into, into a one box. You have tournaments, you have the, uh, so essentially you play tournaments, CCG tournaments with decks of cards that you assemble by in real time turns of going to essentially a card shop and buying packs of cards, booster packs, um, and then kind of just this, and it kind of simulates this like ah, buying, buying pack, 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 packs, and you're buying loads and loads of these packs to sift through to hope to hit uh, the right cards to cycle up to make your deck that you're going to play in the tournament that's coming up. You play, I think it's three tournaments throughout the uh, a game. It's insane. It is fucking insane. I love it. It is. It's. It's this weird black magic-y kind of fucking brain melting game um but it does what it sets out to do it does simulate that cg ccg vibe that those feelings of you in the comic book shop buying packs of magic cards or net runner cards or whatever your thing was um and it is that and it's got the meta elements of the game can go on and just it's incredibly deranged it makes your brain melt um, it's these real real time play elements of where you're just oh shit I need to fucking and, and trying to build a deck and then going into a tournament, fucking amazing. Um, just the sheer uh, adrenaline rush, endorphin buzz vibe off of playing that game is amazing. You're exhausted at the end of it. You're fucking exhausted, um, and you're spent. But you're like kind of God if I had the energy or time and the inclination, I'd play that again but I think it would kill me. Um, I can't recommend Millennium Blades highly enough. It's a game that I love. I don't play it nearly enough because everyone else goes, oh, fuck, no, Mike. And I'm like, yes, we will play again soon. I need to play again soon. Um, it is a fucking insane game. Dogs at the fucking door. <sighs> One moment, for Um Backs to the board game dog is here. You don't really see him because he's just down under the table, but he, he looks like a big furry, just he's a mess. Good boy, he's laid down. Uh, right, where was I? Um, I got distracted by Millennium Blades and started getting a bit excited. I, I will and highly do recommend Millennium Blades, but it is very much... I, I can understand a Marmite guy and totally hates it because it's real time and he just cannot make decisions. Oh, Robbie. We need to play it again, actually, because Robbie and Tony are both incapable of making snap decisions. And this is all a game about, do this decision now! Do more, have more stuff! Big ones of catch! Bah! Um... Yeah, just watch them break. I might have to video it. It'd be funny. Um, and then finally, in the news section, uh, Board Game Geek uh, put up the Golden Geek uh, nominations for this year. It's the 18th, I think it is. Um, I literally went as far as clicking on the link to bring up the nomination screen, which is a big list of apparently every board game that ever existed and some things over here you need to choose. And I just went, oh, fuck off. I mean, no. What the... F what? No. Really? I don't, I, that's just like too much fucking work. So anyway, if you are if you have the inclination, the time, the effort, and, and could be bothered to go through that UI and, and use that to do that, to do the voting, then good on you. Uh, vote away. Um, excellent. I will cover the results of it, I imagine, um, in passing in a couple of weeks, whenever it comes out. And we can look and deeply dive into that, if so wished, at that point in time. Until then, go for it. Other stuff, um, be watching, we watched House of the Dragon, and we're now into that, the second half of House of the Dragon. Oh, the cable from my mic just went like that, and it nearly went across the camera lens. How exciting for you all. You didn't see any of that, I don't think. Oh, it's just fucked everything up. Um, House of the Dragon, uh, yet the second half of the season, I said, I think I touched on this the other day, that I felt that the first half of the season does a lot of heavy lifting to put in place all the elements and story elements and characters to kind of start the engine running and it and it now watching it the second time around the second half the the flip-flop into the richer characters and, and how everything starts to actually really pay off so early into that um 
is fascinating. They did a cracking job. And I, I forgot how much I really did enjoy the second half of um, House of the Dragon. So we watched a few episodes of that. And, and the cast, the adult cast, is, is, is excellent and um, brilliant. I'm really enjoying it. And it's got all the money in the world for it. And the second season's out very soon. Um, but I'm really enjoying that. I thought it was really fucking good. Um, and then we've got uh, Fallout to watch because I haven't watched that yet. I've got about two episodes left of Free Body Problem to watch. I haven't had the time to do it all. I will do if that's of interest to you. I'll even maybe mention it. Putting all of that aside, I um, attended a board game. Uh, no, I didn't. I attended a comic convention, a comic convention and virtual video game, like a touring convention that was in Southampton merely the other day, yesterday, in fact. So me, oh, who d does not game, and little Isaac went along to this. Um, I wasn't expecting much because these things normally are kind of a bit shit. <laughs> you kind of go to score hall and then there's, you know, there's a few, you know, half-hearted displays and some other stuff. Um, to be fair, actually, uh, there were some really good dioramas and bits there, a lot of cosplay, some really good cosplay, um, and some lot of Star Wars stuff. Uh, and some good dinosaur stuff. Isaac loved the dinosaurs, so his little interactive kind of dinosaurs. And uh, Chris Barry was there, which is always nice. Um, I didn't, I didn't actually personally get it. I think the wife, she, I kept saying to her, "Do you not want to?" She loves Red Dwarf, absolutely obsessed with Red Dwarf. And I was like, "Do you not want to go and get autograph with him? Go and get a photo with him?" She's like, "No, don't know. I wouldn't know what to say." She's a bit of a nerd. She loves him. Loves Red Dwarf, but yeah, it wasn't like, no, no. She did get to meet Dorney Five, which kept her happy. Um, what was cool about it was, I mean, it was all cool anyway, but I managed to uh, see a creator who I adore, um, and it had almost fallen off my radar of recent years, but um, David Leach. Now, David Leach uh, has done a lot of stuff, but he mainly, for me, is uh, two things stand out for me that he did. He did this. Dinner Ladies from Hell, which was a story that was published in the ill-fated Toxic comic back in the early 90s. It was a uh, competitor to 2000 AD. They actually were a full-colour comic that forced 2000 AD to up its game and also do comics. And they had a bunch of 2000 AD creators involved in it, including Pat Mills was, the, I think, the editor and kind of creator of it. But you had um, a bunch of other artists and stuff and, and definitely adjacent to 2000 AD guys and girls popping their heads up, one of which was David Lynch, Leach. Um, so he did two stories in there. Uh, Dinner Ladies from Hell, he did um, with Dan Abnett, I think it was, uh, which was, this was just amazing. I loved it. I loved Leach's style of this kind of Wizard and Chips Beano vibe, which he did, I believe, was an artist for them many moons before this. And, the, and again, Wink, a comic that I had fond memories of, which was kind of like a viz for kids at the time. Again, that was probably in the 80s, and that was that was deranged. I remember it, I remember it being short-lived. I think it got outlawed or banned or something because it was just far too, ooh, anarchy. Um, anyway, um, Dear Lakes from Hell uh, was, it just fucked up. I just loved it. It was, I mean, his art is, let's say, it's this Wizard and Chips vibe, but with some really quite messed up stuff going on um, in there, which it totally sits in my wheelhouse. Um, he's a big movie fan, David, uh, and he's got a couple, bunch of other comics out. So this was brilliant. The Driver was another comic he did with um, at the same time as this, which The Driver was... I, I adored The Driver, and I, I don't... That, as far as I know, isn't collected in a, uh, any graphic novel or anything else, but I do have the original to Toxic comics, so I'm going to have to dig them out, I think, just to enjoy the driver again, which was essentially the idea of this, just this massive, giant truck that just was trundling along through, I want to say, a semi-kind of post-apocalyptic America, maybe, but um, just killing things, just driving through schools and hospitals and people and just fucked up. Um, uh, that was good. So there, Dinner Ladies from Hell. He also had, and I picked up, uh, David Lynch, Leach, uh, Lynch, fuck me, Leach Con Conquers the Universe, uh, which is this, he's got one more issue of this to come, uh, which just looks again, just strange. Uh, David's style of art and, and sense of humour is totally all over mine. He's got another comic out called Monolith, which is, looks really fascinating, um, which is just like the idea of the Monolith from 2001, but in various other action movies or movies, uh, and just one page panels of that. But I could, David, I couldn't buy any more, uh, but he did sign these all for me, um, and it was really great just to kind of talk to him and just say, 
David, thank you for all your wonderful work in the past. I loved that stuff, The Driver and Dinner Ladies from Hell, which I have now my signed, collected version of Dinner Ladies from Hell. Thank you, David. Lovely jubbly. I'm going to enjoy that immensely and pass that on to the children. Sure, little Isaac will love that. Um, but, but yeah, brilliant. Um, you can obviously get this stuff, although it's really hard to get. So Dead Universe Comics Publishing published all this stuff. Um, but I challenge you to actually, uh, outside of standing in front of the creator himself and buying them off him, to get hold of those, because I couldn't see an easy route to do it, because I was quite tempted to pick the monolith comics up next month, maybe, when I have furnished with a few more quid. Um, but if you work out how to do it, let me know. Um, you should go and do that. It all looks good stuff. I, I, and it was just nice to, you know, meet one of my comic book heroes. Um, it was really nice to meet him and he was a lovely man and I got some good stuff to read and that was nice and I had a big nerd out and my wife laughed at me and Isaac having big nerd outs so there and that is it on that bombshell that is, brings us to the end of this video um, hopefully we'll be back again soon with more videos that's always usually the idea I do have some very big news to drop at some point but I can't yet can't do that yet, but I will do. Uh, yeah, yeah, tons of wagging exciting. It's not nearly as exciting as you think it's going to be, but it's still kind of exciting and funny. That's all I can say. And um, that's it. I will be back soon with more of the same, I imagine. Or maybe some other different stuff. Who fucking knows? We shall see. For the time being, look after yourselves, play games, and, um, and all of that. Ta-ta. <laughs>